In this lecture, we are going to continue with our discussion of, uh, of plate theory. What we have seen in the previous lecture is that equilibrium equations are not enough to uh, solve uh, the problem. You cannot find the distribution of force resultants and moment resultants just by uh, integrating the equilibrium equations because we have less equations than unknowns. So it is a statically indeterminate problem, so we need to introduce considerations of displacements in order to solve the problem. So what we're going to do now is to derive what we call classical plate theory. And I'll tell you why people call it classical in a second. Of course, for us, it is just plate theory, but there are more complicated versions of this. What we want to do in plate theory in general, as I said, is we want to end up with a set of equations that depend only on x and y, which are the coordinates of the mid-plane of the plate. We don't want any dependence on z. So essentially, we need to factor out any z-dependence in order to simplify the problem. But in general, since a plate is a three-dimensional body, it will have displacements at each point, which are functions of x, y, and, and z. So we need to do something to eliminate the dependence on, on z. But on the other hand, if we had a two-dimensional plane, so if we had points on the plane, and zero thickness, exactly zero thickness, then everything would be function only of x and y. And based on this, we can start thinking to imagine our plate made like a carpet. So you have a very thin substrate and a lot of fibers normal or perpendicular to that substrate which are connected to that substrate. So we're going to think about our plate exactly in the same way. So if we take a section of the plate, this is the real material that we're going to see. And this is our thickness T. But we want to imagine it in a different form. We would like to imagine it in the form of an infinitely thin, or in, say, infinitesimally thin surface. This is our midplane. And connected to that, our th this is an imaginary surface. There is no material there. It's zero thickness. But connected to it, is a bunch of material fibers which are perpendicular to to the plate. So we are thinking about it in this way. Of course, there is an infinite number of these fibers. There is a fiber at each point, and this fiber extends half a thickness above and half a, half a thickness below. OK? Very well. So now, this is before deformation. What is going to happen after deformation? What's going to happen after deformation for the points on the mid-surface is very easy. They will move some amount in x, which we can call u, and some amount in y, which we call v. These are in-plane displacements. And they can move out of plane if we're bending the plate. And this we call out of plane displacement, and this is z displacement w. So essentially, in general, the mid surface will have some mid surface displacements, which we can call u of the mid surface. So I'll put a bar on it. 
V, which is again of the mid surface, I put a bar over it, and W of the mid surface, which I'm going to put a bar above it. It's very easy. It's a surface, so a point on the surface when it moves, the amount of movement will depend on the initial location of that point, which is determined only by x and y. So describing what's happening to points on the surface is already a two-dimensional issue. It depends only on the two coordinates x and y, which is very good. But what about the real displacements of the body? So if we started at a point x, y, and z, where does it go? By definition, it will go to a location displaced by u, v, and w. So y plus v and z plus w, where u, v, and w are the displacement components in x, y, and and z. Where x and y are in the plane, z is in the thickness direction. So this is undeformed, and this is deformed. OK, very well. No problems. And u, v, and w would be functions of x, y, and z. All right. So the actual body displacements are a function of x, y, and z, but the mid-surface displacements are only function of x and y. So what we really want to do is to refer the displacement of a general point in the body to the displacement of the base point on the mid-surface, in the sense that if you have a point x, y, and z, this point is actually connected to the point One second. Yeah. It is connected to the point x, y, and 0 on the mid surface. Yeah. Through one of these material fibers we're talking about. One of these. Here. OK. So now we know what will happen to this point. We know where it's going to move. So the question now is how is a point on the fiber going to move at, with respect to the base point after deformation? So we start, this is the mid surface. This is our fiber here. This is undeformed. And then, after deformation, of course, the mid-surface itself will move. And the fiber itself, every point will move. So it might look something like this. So what we do is, if we have a point, let's say A here, and we want to know the displacement of point A, First of all, we know the location of A with respect to the base point B here. Then, if I know the displacements of the mid-surface, I can know where point B goes in the deformed configuration, which let's call that B prime. And then, if I know the re relative motion between a and B, I can locate A prime, and as such, I can express the displacement of point A. So this is kind of 
how we would like to operate. OK, so we started with a straight fiber like this, which was perpendicular to the midplane. And we ended up with a curved fiber, which is not necessarily even the same length in the z direction. It might have extended or shrank, and which is no longer intersecting at a right angle. So this is not necessarily 90 degrees. So there are three effects which can happen to that material fiber which is perpendicular to the mid-surface in the undeformed configuration. One thing that can happen, it can stretch or shrink Even if it remains straight, it might change length to it may deform in the sense of it no longer remains straight. And three, it may not remain normal to the surface. So these are the three most general possibilities that might happen to that fiber. And classical plate theory is based on assumption, which is due to Kirchhoff. So these are called Kirchhoff assumptions. It is based on the assumption that none of these things happen. So basic idea here is that none of these things happen. So the fibers will not shrink. They will not deform. And they will remain normal to, to the surface. And if all these things are satisfied, then we say that we satisfy the Kirchhoff assumptions, and this is classical plate theory. So let us uh, proceed and derive the displacement field now. So the way it works now is that we do have, this is the mid plane. This is the fiber normal to the surface. Then in the deformed configuration, the mid plane is going to, of course, move. So the base point here is going to move. But the fiber will remain exactly of the same length. It will remain rigid, exactly the same length, straight and perpendicular to the surface. So again, here is my point A, here is my point B, and this is B prime, and this is A prime, and we would like to know the location of point A prime. So in the undeformed configuration, point A has location X, Y, and Z. And point B has a location of x, y, and 0. OK? Now, if we go to the undeformed configuration, you will just, we will add just the displacement components of point B, which is on the mid surface, which are only function of x and y. Our interest at the moment is not in in-plane deformations. Our interest is only in bending. And that's why we are going to assume that u bar and v bar are, are both equal to 0. And this would mean that we would go to a point x, y, and w bar, where w bar is just the displacement in that direction of point b. We are assuming that points on the mid-surface will move only perpendicular to the surface, 
which is the case of pure bending, which is the only case we are going to consider. So now we know where P prime is. The question now is where would A prime be? Because then the relationship between these two would give us the displacements of point A expressed in terms of the displacement of the mid surface. So the question now is how to find the location of A prime. So let us now look at the vector in the direction of the fiber. In the undeformed configuration, this vector, let us call it n, because it is perpendicular to the surface, is simply nothing other than 0, 0, 1. It was just a unit vector in that direction. So what's going to happen is that after deformation, it will map to another vector n prime, which will not be aligned with z anymore because of the rotation of the mid surface. So the distance between a prime and b prime, the initial distance between the two was z, and the distance between the two here also will remain z because we said that this fiber is rigid. There is no extension or shrinkage in that direction, in the fiber direction. So what this means is that the location of A prime is nothing other than x, y, and w prime, which is the location of B prime, plus z in the direction of n prime, where n prime is the direction of the normal. And the direction of the normal itself is just a function of x and y. So at the end of the day, we found the location of the point after deformation based on two things which depend only on x and y. W bar, which is just the vertical displacement of points on the mid surface. And n prime, which is also a function of x and y, which is essentially just the normal direction after deformation, which is perpendicular to the surface. OK, so these two are, of course, related to each other because of the condition that n prime should be perpendicular to the surface, and the surface is described by x, y, and w bar of x and y. So these are the coordinates of a point on the surface. So what would be the normal to the surface? So in order to proceed, we need to relate these two together by the condition of orthogonality, that n prime is orthogonal to the surface defined by x, y, and w bar of x, y. OK, so if you have a surface defined by equations, you can obtain vectors which lie on the surface in the plane itself, which is tangent to the surface, simply by differentiating with respect to x which will give you a tangent in x direction, and differentiating with respect to y, which gives you a tangent in y direction. So what this tells us is that the two vectors defining the tangent plane to the mid-surface after deformation would be given by y, 1, 0, and w, comma, x, and 1, 0, sorry. Uh, and 0, 1, w, comma, y. So this gives us two vectors which lie on the surface. One, which is just a tangent when you take a section 
running along x, and the other one is a vector, the tangent when you take a section of the surface running along y. So n prime is a unit vector which is orthogonal to both of them, which is can be easily done by just taking the cross product of these two. If you take the cross product of these two, we will get simply minus w x minus w y and 1. So n prime will be in this direction. But n prime is a unit vector. It has to be a unit vector, as we agreed. So what you do is you just divide by the magnitude of that vector in order to get it. And the magnitude will be 1 plus wx squared plus wy squared. And this would be the normal after deformation, which again depends only on the vertical displacement of the mid-surface. If we have small rotations, if the angle of rotation is small, then w bar comma x is very small, then we can neglect it with respect to 1. But even if it is moderate, we said that moderate rotations, we're talking about rotations of the order of point 0.1. So even if w bar is of order point 0.1, we are not neglecting point 0.1 with respect to 1. We are neglecting really point 0.1 squared, which is like point 0.01 with respect to 1, which is perfectly acceptable. And as such, whether we're talking about small displacements or moderate rotations, in either case, we can always approximate n prime to be minus w bar comma x minus w bar comma y and 1. And as such, the position of the point after deformation is easy to find. So we start at point at x, y, and z, and then after deformation, we reach x minus z w bar comma x, y minus z w bar comma y, and z plus w bar, where w bar is a function of x and, and y. And as such, since now we know where we started, which we started at x, y, and z, and we ended up in x minus z, comma, x, y minus z, comma, y, and z plus w bar, then the displacements of a general point in the body, in our plate, is going to be u is the change in x, which is going to be minus z w comma x, and v is the change in the y location, which is minus z w comma y, and w is just w bar, which is just a function of x and y. And since they are equal anyways, so I drop the bar on w. So, so this equation, all what it says is that vertical displacement is not function of z. And in reality, our displacement field is really based on, on this, that your displacement is linear in z, v displacement is linear in z, and the rate of change in z depends on the rate of change of w with respect to x and y. And this is the displacement field of the classical uh, plate theory. And it is such that the only unknown displacement is the vertical displacement of the mid-surface. 
and the only dependence we have is on x and and y. All right, so now we have displacement field. This is, these are displacements. So it makes sense from these to start calculating strains. So let us calculate strains and see what's going to happen. First strain we calculate is epsilon x, which is going to be minus z second derivative of w with respect to x. Then we can calculate epsilon y, which is going to be minus z w comma y y, so second derivative with respect to y. Gamma x y is the derivative of u with respect to y plus derivative of v with respect to x. And since when you derive w with respect to x and y, order doesn't make any difference, this comes out equal to minus 2z w comma x y. So the in-plane strains are linear in z and proportional to the second derivatives of w with respect to x and y. What about epsilon z? Epsilon z is the derivative of w with respect to z, which is 0. Gamma xz is the derivative of u with respect to z, which is minus wx, plus the derivative of w with respect to x, and this is 0. And gamma yz similarly is going to be derivative of v with respect to z, which is minus wy, plus derivative of w with respect to y, which is wy, which again is 0. And this shouldn't come here as any surprise d3, because we have already assumed that fibers in that direction are not going to extend or shrink, and this is what me it means for epsilon z to be 0. We also said that there is going to be no change in angle after deformation between these fibers and the xy plane. And this automatically says that gamma xz and gamma yz should end up also being 0. So fair enough. Of course, if you think about it, this doesn't really make sense. Because if I start, let's say, I have a plate and I am bending get in pure bending. There is no lateral loading or anything. So what's going to happen is going to bend like this. OK. We know that under pure bending, there can't be any out of plane stresses. So sigma z will be exactly 0. Tau xz is 0 tau yz is 0. So what we do know is that under pure bending, that this plate is actually going to be in what we called a state of plane stress. And as we discussed in that lecture, we cannot simultaneously satisfy that epsilon z is 0 and sigma z is 0 if sigma x and sigma y are non zero. So the displacement field says that epsilon z is 0, but we do know physically that we're not going to have plane strain, we are going to have plane stress, which says that tau xz is 0 tau yz is 0, and sigma z is 0. So which one of these should we believe? Actually, part of classical plate theory is to assume that the plate is in a state of plane stress, because this is the physically correct description of what's actually happening, at least under pure bending, which is the simplest possible case of plate bending. So what we really say at the end is that this displacement field here is not really 
the most accurate description of displacements in a plate undergoing bending deformations, but it is sufficiently accurate. So instead of thinking about the displacement field as predicting epsilon z, gamma xz, and gamma yz are all equal to zero, we should really think about it that epsilon z, gamma xz, gamma yz are all negligible, and as such, it doesn't matter whether our displacement field predicts them to be zero or very small numbers. So that's one aspect of the discussion. The other aspect of the discussion is that, if you remember, the virtual work of external of internal forces under in-plane loading and under uh, plane stress conditions was just sigma x delta epsilon x plus sigma y delta epsilon y plus tau xy delta gamma xy dx dy dz, so the integration over volume. And as such, you don't see in this expression any contribution from epsilon z or gamma xz or gamma x uh, yz because the corresponding stresses are zero. And what this means is that it is not very important for us if we are in, plane, in, in a state of plane stress to model the out of plane strains very accurately because these strains will not contribute to the virtual work. So it is sufficiently good that we are able to get a good description for epsilon x, epsilon y, and gamma xy, which what we have right now is that all of these guys are linear in z. So this means that the in-plane strains are linear in z, and this would mean that the in-plane stresses are also linear in z, because for plane stress, we know the relationship between sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy on one side and the epsilon x, epsilon y, gamma xy on the other side. So what we, we know is that sigma x is going to be e over 1 minus nu squared times epsilon x, which is plus mu epsilon y. And that is common. Sigma y is going to be e over 1 minus nu squared minus wyy minus nu wxx times z. And tau xy is going to be G, which is e over 2 times 1 plus nu, times gamma xy, which is just minus 2 w comma xy times z. So what we have here is that the stresses are linear in z, and the slope will depend on the second derivatives of the bending of the bending displacement. OK, very well. So now we have a description of all stresses. So we can go and substitute these into the equilibrium equation. But this is a plate, so we don't want to use the three-dimensional equations of the three-dimensional equations of equilibrium. What we would really like to do is to first obtain the stress and moment resultants 
which are how we express the equilibrium equations for the plate. So we had three moment resultants. We had mx, my, and myx. And two force resultants, which were the shear force per unit length qx and qy. qx and qy depended on tau xz and tau yz, which is by assumption are zero. This might indicate that qx and qy are identically zero, which is, of course, nonsense, because our force equilibrium equation used to read qx comma x plus qy comma y plus q equals zero. So if you have lateral pressure, you will have to have non-zero shear forces, or otherwise you cannot satisfy the force equilibrium in that direction. So again, we are the assumption of plane stress is an approximate assumption. So the stress is not going to be exactly in plane. It will just be that the in-plane stresses are much larger than the out-plane stresses. So this is more or less the assumption we're making, that sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy are much larger than sigma z, tau xz, and tau uh, yz, such that we can more or less neglect the effect of the out-of-plane stresses. So again, what we're really doing is that we are neglecting in-plane, out-of-plane stresses and out-of-plane strains. They are not identically zero, really, but since they are small, we are neglecting their contribution. So we're left only with mx, my, and mxy, or yx. Again, mxy is just minus myx, doesn't matter. So what we want to do is to express these based on the expressions for stresses we have, which is very easy. For example, mx is just integration from minus t over 2 to t over 2, sigma x, z, dz. What you have here is all these terms don't depend on z, so they are just constants. So this will be just e over 1 minus mu squared minus wxx minus mu wyy. And then the only integration we need to do is from t over 2 to t over 2, z squared dz. And this integration here will give us t cubed over 12. And as such, we can write mx to be e t cubed over 12, 1 minus mu squared minus w x minus u w comma y y and this value here is usually given the sample d and it is thought of as the bending stiffness of the plate. So if we do the same for m y and m y x We are able to find the following expression, and I'm going to put it in matrix form, that mx is equal to d minus wxx minus nu wyy. My is d minus wyy minus nu wxx and myx is d one minus nu over two minus 
2w, xy, which can be put in matrix form, as I said, which is mx, my, mx, b is equal b, 1, nu, nu, 1, And on the other side, we have, and these are called curvatures. So, because it's second derivative of vertical displacement, so WXX is a curvature of a section of the plate along X. WYY is a section of the plate, curvature of a section of the plate along Y. And the third component here, which is related to which is related to the twisting moment, it, it actually represents the twist rate of the plate. So, so this is curvature, curvature, and twist. Very well, so now we know the bending resultants as functions of our uh, displacement w, which is the only displacement unknown, and it's o it's a function only of x and and y. So, in order to obtain an equation that governs w, we would like to substitute this relation into the equilibrium conditions. So, the equilibrium conditions, as we derive them in the previous lecture are as follows. We had qx comma x plus qy comma y plus q equals zero. We had mx comma x plus mYx comma y equals qx. We had mYx comma y plus my comma y equals qy. So these are the three equilibrium equations. The first one force in z, and the other two are moments around moment equations, but moment balance around x and y axes. So the question is. We have one unknown w, so how are we going to how are we going to solve? But in reality, we cannot express qx and qy as functions of w. Why? Because our displacement field, the assumption we made, predicted zero gamma xz and gamma yz, which means zero tau xz and tau yz. So we already know that our displacement description is not accurate enough to predict the shear forces. It is just good enough to predict the bending moments and the twisting moments. So what we need to do is to eliminate the shear forces from the equilibrium condition. And we do that by substituting for, from Qx from this equation and from Qy from this equation into our force equilibrium equation in Z. So what we'll end up with is Qx comma x is just going to be mx comma x x, so second derivative of mx with respect to x, plus the mixed derivative of yx with respect to xy. Qy comma y will give us the mixed derivative of yx with respect to xy, so you end up with a 2 here, and plus the second derivative of y, my with respect to y, plus q equals 0. And this is now a single equilibrium equation, which depends only on the moment resultants. It doesn't depend on the shear resultants at all.
So the out of plane shear doesn't appear in this equation, only second derivatives of bending and twisting moments. So if we substitute from the relationship between the twisting moment and bending moments and W into this equation and simplify, we get a single equation which is function of W. And if we do that, we will find that this equation looks like And this is the equation that governs plate bending. It's a single equation in a single unknown function, which is W, which is the out of plane displacement of the plate. And that is a function of only X and Y. So if we know the loading, which is Q, Q as a function of x and y, if we are able to solve this equation, we can obtain w. And once we know w, then from this constitutive law here, we are able to find mx, my, and myx. And from these, we can calculate also qx and qy. So we know all the bending resultants, twisting resultants, and shear resultants. Then the question is, and then what happens? Because mx, my, myx, because if you know w, you know how much your plate is going to deform, so you answer the question of how my structure is going to deform under loading, which is one of the two important questions we need to ask. The other important question is to find the stress distribution. So finding mx, my, and the myx in itself is not sufficient. We need to calculate sigma x, sigma y, and sigma and, and tau xy. So if we go back here, we find that sigma x, sigma y, tau xy is function of wxx, wyy, and wxy. And from here, we are able, from this equation here, we already know wxx, wyy, wxy, so we can substitute and get sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. But actually, things are much simpler than that because, in reality, um, we can always replace wxx, wxx, wyy, and wxy by mx, my, myx because there is a relation between them. And if we do that, we can find simple equations for stress distribution in terms of uh, bending resultants and twisting resultants. So if we do the substitution, we end up with sigma x is 12 over t cubed mx times z, sigma y is 12 over t cubed my times z, and tau xy is 12 over t cubed myx. So the process of solution is as follows. Solve the classical plate equation, which is fourth order. for 
in W is function of x and y. So this is the first step. From there, we can calculate mx, my, and mxy simply by differentiation and using the matrix we defined before. And from that, calculate stress distribution sigma x sigma y tau x y and we agreed that the out of plane stresses are negligible so you can use these stresses already to evaluate whether your structure is going to fail or not and next lecture we discuss how to solve the equations. Of course, a missing ingredient, if you have a differential equation, you cannot solve it without boundary conditions. So we need to talk about boundary conditions and then how to solve the equation. We'll be able to solve it only in special cases. So we're going to discuss at least one special case. Uh, and then um, when we cannot solve the equation exactly, we can solve it approximately. And this is also something we are going are going to discuss. But the basic procedure is quite simple. First, you solve for the displacement from the plate equation. Then you calculate the bending resultants. And from the bending resultants, you calculate stresses. And this way, you obtain both deformations and stress distribution. <laughs>